street I feel a Casanova when the girls compete the Whiskey is flowing and the band keeps the beat The boys are headed down to the girl is street Duffy Bess, Madame Dell They're waiting for me at the Yellow Hotel Poker in the parlor, steaks are on the grill All the boys are headed down to the Yellow Hotel Lusk, Wyoming is a small town of 1,500 people, located in the eastern part of the state, not far from the Nebraska border. Not much happens in Lusk, save a few visits from tourists passing through each summer, but her quiet demeanor masks a history virtually unheard of in the 20th century. Let me explain. Bordellos existed across the frontier throughout the rough and tumble days of settling the Old West. But one of the most famous of them all, the Yellow Hotel in Lusk, operated openly on the main street until 1978. Join me as we discover the truths and examine the fictions behind the Yellow Hotel and its madam, Del Burke. The, the memory that Del left as a colorful character and one of, one of Wyoming's most colorful characters, um, it, it's priceless. I, I love the memory of Del, although I never had the pleasure of loving Del. <laughs> After stints in Alaska and Casper, Wyoming, Dell arrived in Lusk in 1919, along with her partner, Bessie Housley. They pitched a tent across from the railroad station and announced that they were open for business. With the nearby Lance Creek oil boom in full swing, business was good indeed. The local sheriff was not particularly enamored with their choice of professions and repeatedly sought to shut down the operation. Dell was not to be dissuaded. She constructed her famous hotel on the property and with the approaching depression discovered a unique way of keeping her business operating. In the 20s, there came a time when the power plant, the, power, the water and power plant was uh, in bad need of repair and the town didn't have it. Uh, when I, uh, th that the word was that Dell stepped in and helped out financially. Recently, I ran into a man who was at the meeting that uh, Del Burke pitched in and helped pay for the uh, power and light, which backs up her occasional comments to people who were saying things like, well, you, we, we gotta run that, how, uh, that brothel out of town. That's, that's just not good. And she, she's, her answer was at least once, well, you shut me down, I'll shut down the lights. And now I know she really could have. Ladies in the lobby, I know them well. Peaches and poppy, margarita and bell. The way they look, how great they smell. Keeps me coming back to the Yellow Hotel. Friday is payday, Saturday I see the ladies. Sunday go to church, cause I'm gonna get saved. We're singing hallelujah. Save my soul, cause I can't refuse you. I'm going back to the Yellow Hotel. I wanted to talk about the double life, because I was really fascinated with how anybody could live a double life and actually keep those two things separate. Well, the way she could do that was that her family in Michigan didn't come to Wyoming very often. So by that time, by the time they, they did, she owned a piece of property that she called her ranch that was, oh, maybe 15 minutes uh, east of uh, Lusk. A little house there and some land around it and where she took her girls for a vacation day on Sundays and other things like that. So when her families arrived from Michigan, she would whisk them out to the ranch and they never saw the girls they did kind of wonder how she managed to, to support herself with a hotel in that small a town, but she did all right, so, so they didn't ask. Uh, she did introduce her family to just one or two people in Lusk, but obviously she told them do not tell anybody else, and they didn't. Uh, so that the people in, that were her customers didn't know about Marie Fisher, 
and her family didn't know about Del Burke. That all changed when, in about 1979, I think it was, when Del fell and broke her hip. Uh, they had to call in the family, and when they did call in the family, the family was quite rudely awakened to the fact that Del had been functioning as a brothel madam. Part of the family had a hard time believing it, uh, absolutely disowned it, disowned her, and a few of the family were fascinated. With the hotel no longer in danger of being shut down, Dell very quietly began her philanthropic ventures. She was very concerned about the future of Lusk, I'm assuming, because one of the things she did was she very discreetly and privately helped to fund kids going to college. Uh, some of them rather blatantly and rather strongly denied ever having had that happen, but the circumstances are so strong that yes, she did. Some of the kids never knew that she was backing them. It is also likely that some of them were told, don't admit it. This was, this was in the 50s and 60s, and I can rather imagine how some people would have felt going to a doctor who had been uh, uh, financed by the local prostitute, that it might have kind of been a little dicey for the uh, customers, so that privacy was, was valuable. I'm sure she did have a, um, not an opinion, but an influence on some of the history. We all know about the young fellows that she would make sure got to school. She uh, did scholarships. She was very charitable. She gave to all the different kinds of organizations, belonged to the Farm Bureau and the Chamber of Commerce. She made sure that there was donations given to all of the churches. She made sure there were no um, activity at her place on Sunday. It was closed so that nobody could ever say she kept anybody from going to church. She was a very smart businesswoman. We all know that she was over a millionaire when she left, and it wasn't because of Dell's Hotel. It was her smart business sense and the way she invested her money. One of the things that fascinated me was in looking at the records of the magazines that she, uh, that she subscribed to. There were things like Ladies Home Journal and, and household things, but there were also things like uh, Forbes and other financial magazines. There were magazines about ranching. There were magazines about a number of different topics. She was a well-read lady. Dell loved the finer things in life, and her business allowed her to travel to faraway places. She kept a wardrobe of fine clothing that she would never wear in lust for these trips. Her taste was excellent. She had just showed good taste in everything that she used, did for herself. Her clothing was always tasteful, always discreet. Uh, her rules for her girls reflects that. Good taste, good behavior. Uh, she loved fur coats, she loved fine things. She kept her fur coats in a, uh, uh, a vault in uh, Cheyenne. She didn't bring them into Lusk because she didn't use them there. She used them in Cheyenne and in New Denver so that her most beautiful clothing, most, most prized things like that were not in Lusk because they wouldn't have fit in and it wouldn't have been her, her, with her, within her style. The Pioneer Museum, I think it is, uh, and uh, they put out a really nice uh, display of Del Burke's things. 
uh, among the things that they had, and they let me borrow, was a series of uh, her bank books and uh, records and uh, documents. These had been placed there by Red Fenwick's uh, widow after his death, because Red Fenwick was a, a newspaper reporter down in Denver, and he became good friends with uh, Dell in her earlier years. And you know, one of the quotes that I've always liked was by um, Red Fenwick, and he uh, was a friend of Dale's for over uh, Dale's for over 25 years, and he called Dale a living legend. In a column that he wrote at the Denver Post shortly after uh, she had died, he said she was one of the wealthiest women in Wyoming and certainly one of the most charitable. And then Fenwick wrote. Um, he recalled autographing his book, which was called Red Fenwick's West for Dell, with the inscription of, to a lovely little lady in red velvet who perhaps more eloquently than any other woman can testify to the masculinity of a true masculine state, Wyoming. So she was very conscious of who she was and what she was. She did not want in any way to embarrass either the men or the wives uh, of the people in town, and so she went out of her way to make sure that that didn't happen, so that neither, neither uh, the men acknowledged her or her girls acknowledged the men. When she first started, one of the fun things I think that uh, we've all heard about is that, of course, she built her establishment across the street from the depot, very smart move when those people would come into town and at five o'clock when it was time for her to be open, she'd step out on the front porch and ring a little brass bell and everybody knew that Dell's was open. Lots of ladies would come across the street thinking that it was a hotel that had traveled there on the train and she would just very pleasantly tell them that they'd be happier if they went up and stayed at one of the other places that was there. Friday is payday, Saturday I see the ladies Sunday go to church cause I'm gonna get saved We're singing hallelujah Save my soul cause I can't refuse ya I'm going back to the Yellow Hotel Saying hi to Miss Duffy, good evening Miss Dell Lila was a real kick she was, she had a little round face and she was just smiling all the time. I can remember what a shock it was when I went to shampoo her hair because her hairline came clear back to here. She'd had that many facelifts, I'm going to assume. And I don't know if Lila was her real name, but uh, she certainly had bleached hair that was lilac color. Uh, Lila never carried a purse. She always carried a shopping bag. I'm not sure what all was in the shopping bag, but I don't think it was in very good order. Because when she would go to pay for you, it was usually just with paper dollar bills or something like that. And they were never um, put together like most of us would into a, an envelope or into your wallet. They were just wadded up and dropped in there. And she'd reach in there and get them out and flatten them out until we got to the right amount of money. So She showed up at the beauty shop one day and she had a Fredericks of Hollywood catalog. She said, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these before. You don't have to get some of the stuff that we do, but it has really cute clothes. And she'd flip to the pages of thinking those things that I should like. She required her girls to never flaunt themselves, never go out and solicit on the streets, to, to be a uh, uh, respectable woman when they went out on, and did talk with people. Uh, She would get a report that uh, a couple of girls had, oh well, at least on one occasion, a couple of girls went down to, uh, to Lingle, I think it was, and uh, got drunk and uh, tried to seduce some young men. And uh, when they got back to town, she met them with their suitcases and took them to the bus station and said, out. She did not allow flag flagrant uh, behavior. She just did not condone that. That was one time when a girl got sent back, sent packing on the bus, when she looked up and said, well, hi, 
Johnny or Charlie or whoever it was. And the wife was standing next to him and looked at Dell and looked at her and the young lady in question was on the bus very, very soon. Us boys, high school boys were driving around on a noon hour and stuff like boys that age do. Dell required her girls to always dress nice and when they's out on the street and to wear a hat and those la young ladies wore big nice hats, expensive hats. We'd see a, you know, a, a lady wearing a hat on the, on the streets of Lutz is quite unique and unusual. Us boys driving around, we'd see a lady walking down the sidewalk all dressed up wearing a hat. Somebody said that, would say, that's Dell's new girl. How do you know? Oh, somebody told me, yeah, yeah, you know. But they always were dressed nice and wore big, big nice hats. When she had a new girl arrive and she wanted to introduce her to the town, she would have the girl go shopping for some, some small item at one of the stores carrying the puppy dog. And uh, the, the men all knew that uh, this meant there was a new girl over at Dell's Hotel. So that was her, the one way that she did uh, uh, do a little bit of advertising. Scent of a woman in that white woman breeze That scent of man is what a honey is to bees She's floating down Main Street, stroking that little hound Every fellow knows there's a new gal in town. A young lady came in to the store one day early on. She was dressed in a very bright orange pantsuit. And the minute she stepped in the door, the fragrance of the most wonderful perfume floated through the air. And she probably was carrying the trademark, which was a little dog. Anyway, she wanted to buy a, a, a radio on time, pay half and half more in two weeks and she asked me if she could do that and I said well I'll have to ask the boss and so I asked my husband and I told him she wanted to pay half now and half later he said well who do you work for and she said Del Burke he kind of wrinkled his brow and he said what do you do and she, this young lady looked at me kind of confused and like help me here <laughs> She got, she got the radio. <laughs> I was going upstairs, Dad was coming down. We did the hokey pokey and we turned ourselves around. When in strolls my brother, we tried to take cover. In three-part harmony, we said, don't tell mother. It just seemed like for at least the male part of the population that a visit to the Yellow Hotel was almost a given uh, in your life as a, a rite of passage or something that, that, that it would happen. Uh, they were fairly, uh, they were more open about that than you would expect people to be about visits to a whorehouse. The wind is big and bebop on a high tension line For a sweet ten seconds, you're off of my mind Praise the Lord, I miss you tonight And then your mess is gone ringing down the long distance line I count the hours since I last kiss I called and I'll write the who you promises I hear your laughter bouncing off of the moon Called to say you tried to see me Soon you're gonna lose that love sometime Big hearts, you don't lose your mind She operated very, very, run a very good place and uh, if, you know, some, some ladies might not think it Cat House is a good place, but <laughs> she ran it for many years, and she had no trouble with the law. She closed at midnight, and uh, if anybody was drinking and she could tell it, she wouldn't let them in. 
Adele, uh, her farm that she had, or the small ranch she had east of town, was across from property of ours. And uh, Joe got her irrigation water turned off, and she was very angry and upset. And I got it uh, turned back on for her. So she was friendly to me. I did not see her very often. She did not allow, she did not speak to people first. They had to speak to her and then she would answer them. She never allowed her girls that worked for her to talk to anyone. They would come in to Dr. Collins, the dentist's office, Dr. Paulson, the eye doctor's office, and they would tell us that they always knew who the ladies were, and we said, how did you know? And they said, because they always pay us in $5 bills. <laughs> On Saturdays, I would work in the Kilmer Creamery. And uh, the head of the Kilmer Creamery was, was Roscoe. A lot of them called him Gus. But he was uh, the real uh, manager, the one that kept things going for Kilmer Creamery. My noon hour was from 11.30 to 12.30. I would leave the Creamery and cross the street going about a block and a half to uh, a little restaurant called Bud's Hamburgers. They made great hamburgers, cheeseburgers, and... Mrs. Roberts always had good homemade pie, and I'd go over there most of the time, eat, and then I'd return to the Kilmer Creamery. And many times, I'd say maybe once a month, I'd, on, I'm talking about Saturdays, I would start across the street, and here would come Del Burke coming up the street, going south towards the uh, a nice dress shop that was uh, on her route. She would be walking about one, two, it'd probably be about four blocks up there. And as I crossed the street, I remember she would look over and see me. She was quite a lady. She never stopped me, but as we got close, she would look up, smile, and wink at me and just keep going. She went over the noon hour because she knew the ladies of the town would be at home fixing the, eat the noon meal for their husbands, and it was a good time where she wouldn't attract a lot of attention. She was always dressed real sharply, a small lady. You could tell uh, that she was a nice looking lady and probably rather attractive when she was younger. That was my recollection of her walks up to, uh, to uh, town. I grew up and graduated from Lusk, and one of my good friends uh, in, in high school, we were driving around, wasting, wasting time driving up Dragon Main in lovely Lusk back in the 70s, and, and I believe Mike would have been a sophomore and I'd have been a junior, maybe I was a senior and he was a junior, but Mike was, big man. I mean, Mike, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, weighed 275 pounds, and I wasn't real big, but anyway, we decided we would go to Dell's Yellow Hotel, you know, as young guys, and just go up there and knock on the door and see what happens. So I was driving, and I got up, got out, and I went up and knocked on the door. And Dell, I remember Dell Burke looked out the window, and she said, honey, she says, uh, when you grow up, you can come back. Okay, I was, I was a year older than Mike was. So we went and laughed about it, drove up and down Main Street, and Mike was a big kid, and he had on a, on a, on a hat, kind of a derby hat, and he went back, and he knocked on the door, and so she opened the door and offered to let him in. Then he started doing the back pedal. <laughs> And he says, well, I'm here, with, uh, I'm here with my buddies, he says. He couldn't believe that she was going to let him in anyway. Then he got cold feet, so we, he came back and got in the car. And... 
That was the last time we visited Dallas. Should ever wanna know there's a new gal in town. Cowboys and bankers and oil field trash. Truckers, lawyers, our business is cash. Pilgrims, doctors, roused about when that redhead walks in, man, the money walks out. There's a new gal in town. Yes, a new gal in town. Ask Madame Dell, she'll show you around. Be the first to know that little girl, girl in town. Yes, there's a new girl in town. When I first moved there, I I was pretty young, but I, of course, you know, kids hear everything. I knew what was going on there at the Yellow Hotel. And then later on, when I started running the milk route, of course, I got acquainted with her. And she, she was, as far as I know, a, a real nice lady. A lot of people wouldn't agree with the business she was in, but that was what she done, and she done it right. We had went to library and got our library books, and we were walking home, and we were tired, so we thought we would just take a seat on Del Burke's stairs. And we were sitting there reading Dr. Seuss, my brother and I, and... Um, a person from our church drove by and asked, said, hey kids, do you guys want to ride home? And we said, no thank you, we're waiting for our dad. And we just couldn't figure out why he was laughing so hard. One Saturday morning, I believe it was, I was in the back of the creamery. I remember I was washing a can. We had the 10 gallon milk cans. We'd put them in a, a, a can container. It was steam driven and it wash those cans, it'd circle and come out and you'd put them in and take them out. And I had to get something in the office up front. I went up to the front, had my Kilmer Creamery white uniform on. It said Kilmer Creamery on the back and phone three was the phone number. And as I walked in, Del Burke was paying her bill with uh, Roscoe Kilmer, head of the of the creamery in there again. It was over the noon hour. And as I came in, she saw me and recognized me right away. And and there again, she smiled, didn't say a word, but she gave me that big wink of hers. I went ahead and picked up what I wanted, went back and thought no more about it. I guess I probably always knew about Del Burke, but never really personally came across her until um, about 1967, and that's when I had a beauty shop in Lusk. And the operators that she had always used in the past had passed on or moved or something. So the first one that came to my establishment, her name was Lila, and she was one of the girls that was working for Dell. And I don't think that Dell maybe realized that she had done that because after Lila had had a couple of appointments with me, then I was in the back. Um, cleaning up and doing some stuff and I came back out to the office and there sat Dell. And she was very quiet and she just approached me and she wanted to make sure that I was comfortable with having Lila come there to get her hair done. And that if she should get her hair done, would that be okay? Did they have to come at separate hours? Um, or should they use the back door to come in or whatever? And I welcomed them just like I would any of my customers. I said, you use the front door and come any time that you need to make an appointment. But I can tell you my experience with her, she treated me a whole lot better than some of my clients that I had that thought they were the uppity ones that wouldn't cross the street if she happened to be out there. And none of us ever know what happens to people in their younger life and maybe puts them down a certain path. And I never felt that any of us were there to judge her. And she often made the statement, if women took care of their own men, then they wouldn't have to be there. All of the uh, stores uh, had their employees in costume. And Dell was, was not to be left behind. 
she had the Avon sales lady call me and see if she asked, would I be willing to make the costumes for her and her girls? And uh, so I said, well, I'll consult my husband, see what he says. And he worked for the lumber yard. And uh, he says, heavens, yes, her money's as good as anybody else's. And uh, I said, okay, so I told the Avon lady, that's fine, I'd do, the, do it if she wanted me to. And so it wasn't long till I had a phone call from Dale to find out if I would make the costumes for her and her two girls. So we set up appointments and uh, they came for fittings and I made all three and she was the only one that gave me a, a tip at the end. They were very nice to work for, very polite. They talked about uh, style shows in Vegas and other places and, and it was uh, a pleasant uh, arrangement. It's really hard to say exactly when she stopped having customers come to her uh, or come to her. There were people, there was, okay, there was a, a man who claimed that he was her favorite uh, customer because she would call him when uh, she was horny. However, I think that might have been more in the legendary rumor faction. But uh, there were all other men who said that she was the lady who went upstairs with them in her later years, and they were older men, so that apparently the ages uh, meshed well that way. I think one of the saddest things was um, her good friend, Jerry Dull. I don't think it was probably a romantic thing when it started, but when he was injured in the oil field and had lost his uh, foot, he came down and between the two of them, uh, he had gotten set up in a bar that was kind of a catty corner from the Yellow Hotel. And so they had quite a friendship and um, they did a lot of traveling together and they were to be married. And just before the marriage was to be done, why uh, he passed away from a heart attack or something like that. And I thought, how sad that she finally had found someone and uh, they couldn't have spent more time together and continued their life because at that time Dell didn't need to run the hotel. She had enough money. She just could have retired and traveled. But without Jerry to travel with then she just stayed there in Lusk and lived out the rest of her life. At some point she, her dogs probably died and she just didn't replace them. Later visitors to her home were really surprised to see in her kitchen all these little dishes with food in them. And they asked her, uh, what, 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 what's going on? And Del said, well, the cats get hungry. And so she, she was feeding a bunch of kitty cats. And that was a real shift for her. I don't think any of us realized as she had gotten older, I'm going to assume it was like dementia, because she always ordered her stuff out of Denver, um, Denver May DNF, and there were boxes and it would be repeat boxes, like if she bought a bathroom set with the rugs and everything that matched, there would be one and then there would be another and another and another and they'd all be in the same color and they'd never been opened. So you realize then she had no one there to help her and she was just struggling and doing the best that she could. The ending of her life was very lonely and very sad. Um, she was a very private person, therefore she really hadn't made any friendships that would like people going up to the nursing home to visit her or something like that and I actually don't think that she wanted them to. Uh, 
It's just the way she had lived her life. Her, uh, her family, goodness knows, knew that they had an aunt there, but I don't think any of them realized what she was doing because she didn't want them to know. But I think she was very kind to them and she probably sent them uh, money and, and help take care of anybody that she could. There were letters that they had written back and forth and she never would sign them as Del Burke because she used her own name, Mary Ada or Marie Fisher. And I look back on it now and I wonder if I would have gone to the nursing home and tried to visit her if she would have allowed me in the room or not. Because she'd always said, you know, if you see me out, don't speak to me, just walk on by like you don't know me. And so I think she died probably a lonely person and the only people that she visited with was probably her lawyer. In 79, 80, she broke her hip and then died in 80. So that she, she practiced pretty, pretty much solidly from 1919 until 1978 in an illegal business. It's long, best be on my way. Hey, all along you've been my home, but I'm leaving you today. Your friends will be happy just to see me on the land. They'll come around, don't like flies, tell me what I am. Hey, would my babe sit so long? Well, I'll be seeing you. If the first time I knew the story of Del Burke. I was a young reporter, possibly a rookie reporter at the Casper Star Tribune. And I was assigned to cover the uh, auction of her, her, her worldly possessions. Um, she had died. She had no direct family. My recollection was she had no direct family. Uh, and everything was being liquidated for what other heirs there were. Um, and they were, they had just gone into the old yellow hotel in, in Lusk and were selling everything. And uh, as you'd imagine, the, 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 the estate sale of a, of a, you know, a famous Wyoming madam's possessions was going to draw a few people. So the Star Tribune sent me down and uh, I covered that, that remarkable auction. Uh, we were fortunate enough uh, when Dell uh, passed away in the late 70s, uh, Bob Fister, local attorney, attorney for the estate, uh, contacted me and asked me if we would be interested in, in making a bid or conducting an auction to disperse the estate of Dell Burke. So being young and from Lusk and an auctioneer, and I knew that there'd probably be no other chance to uh, get a chance to sell a bordello in my lifetime, so I called my brother Sean and and told him that I was going to bid on that. And he was actually he was off rodeoing for the summer, and he said, "Do whatever you want, that's fine." And so uh, if I knew what I if I knew then what I knew knew now, I would have bid it a lot higher. But I uh, I actually bid that sale for two percent of the gross. I lined it up, did all the work, and paid all the advertising. So uh, several years later, I was kind of a fool on that, but I wanted to make sure that I got, got the sale for the, for the Bordello. It was a two-day auction. Uh, she owned a ranch, about a 415-acre ranch, a couple miles east of town, where she, she and her gals, I guess, went out there and relaxed and got away from the, from the hotel. and. Uh, we uh, auctioned that off, uh, the personal belongings out of that on a, on a Friday afternoon. And I think we started about 3 in the afternoon and we finished about 7.30 or quarter 8 that night. And then the next day we uh, did an auction uh, at the, uh, right at the grounds there of, of the Yellow Hotel and her buildings and the vacant lots uh, there on the edge of town. I think that when the people came to the auction, I'm not sure what they were looking for, but I think they were very surprised by the quality and good taste that she had and the things that she had purchased. Whenever they would travel, her and Jerry would go out 
they would leave the United States or traveling right in the States. She liked to go down in the South a lot. And she collected art and tapestry and wonderful vases and, and different things. And she displayed them in the hotel for other people to be able to see. I can remember one, one other deal that we did. Uh, my brother thought of an idea. We, we ordered 700 t-shirts and they were yellow t-shirts with black lettering and a shot of Dell's Yellow Hotel on it. And we sold those for $7 a piece. And on that, it said, I got a piece of the Old West at Dell's Yellow Hotel, Lusk, Wyoming. You know, some of the items that sold, she had an old, older car there. I'm, I'm thinking it was a 1956 model. Uh, I think it bought about $2,500, if I remember correctly. The first thing I uh, recalled was that my husband bought Dell's car at the auction and it was a really top-of-the-line Chrysler. It was a lavender color, and it had every single feature that was possible to get on a car at the time she bought it. It even had a, a, a search button on the floor. So as you're listening to the radio and you wanted to change stations, you could reach over with your left foot and change the radio. And uh, my husband treasured that car, and we thought it was great fun to drive it occasionally in parades. We auctioned off the real estate and there was eight or nine vacant lots I believe and then of course uh, the the two-story uh, bordello plus a storage building uh, that she used for storage right there and lo and behold uh, of all the people to buy it Webb Stoddard a rancher who's now passed away and and our dad Joe Madden they locked horns on it and the bidding went up there and and my dad was the successful bidder uh, that time I remember I think it brought around 43,000, 43,500 somewhere in there for that but uh, my dad just kind of got wrapped up in the auction and have no idea why he really wanted it other than euphoria and etc. Somebody said well ask dad what he was going to do with it and some people said make it into a bed and breakfast or a steakhouse and you know somebody said give it to the state and unfortunately uh, he, he never did do anything with it and uh, uh, ended up, our dad, dad passed away and uh, we ended up uh, auctioning it off, I suppose, I don't even remember when it was, the, the remainder of the buildings and the vacant lots uh, got auctioned off there, I, I would assume in 2007, 8, 2009, something like that. By the early 2000s, the yellow hotel had fallen into disrepair. The bright yellow paint had faded, and the hotel became the party center of quite a different sort. Considering it a health hazard, the city burned down the hotel on May 6, 2012, thus ending the 95-year history of the yellow hotel. The conservation district built a new office on the property. However, before they could fully move in, it was destroyed by the flood of 2014. The Nyborough Conservation District decided to uh, purchase property for their own facility and get out of the federal building uh, in 2011 and when this property came available we purchased it from Mr. Flint in Reno, Nevada and proceeded to build a structure for our educational uh, conservation facility and that started in 2013. In 2014, the structure was established and we uh, moved in last August. And in June, we had the flood uh, that damaged the structure to the point we don't know what we're going to do now, but we would like to stay here and uh, carry on with our business. But. an 
Wyoming Ninth, I felt it was important to preserve history. Um, and even though some people don't agree with what the Yellow Hotel was, it's a huge part of our community in the past and kind of a tourism type of deal now. So I, uh, as soon as we contact, uh, got the contract for the property, I went searching for a grant to pay for a marker to mark the Yellow Hotel and provide the information about Del Burke and what a wonderful lady she was. The train station is still here, although the trains don't stop anymore. The old power and light plant that Del may or may not have owned a majority share of is still standing. But all evidence that the Yellow Hotel stood here is now gone. The Conservation District office, damaged by the flood, has been renovated and turned into a private residence. This marker, standing on a side street, is the only recollection of the 60 years the hotel operated as an integral part of this small western town. Some say Lusk may not have survived without Del Burke. Well, I doubt that thought. I feel certain that Lusk would be a much different town without the impact that Del Burke had made for so many years. At this point, Del Burke is a total special person to me. Uh, I know that had I ever talked to her or interviewed her or met her in Lusk, I would not have gotten to know her anywhere near what I've gotten to know her now. And that's because she would have held me at such a distance because she did that with everybody in Lusk. I, uh, I like Del Burke, never met her. Um, I, I, I'm glad she was among us. I'm glad she left these stories. I'm glad we can talk about the Yellow Hotel. There are so many of those characters in Wyoming history. It was like so many other things. I hope we don't lose them. I hope, we, I hope the, the internet age preserves them. Well, Madame Zell had the Yellow Hotel And her ladies looked so fine With sweet perfume, cozy rooms And a good hot loving time I feel a Casanova when the girls compete the Whiskey is flowing and the band keeps the beat The boys are headed down to the girl is street Duffy Bess, Madame Dell They're waiting for me at the Yellow Hotel Poker in the parlor, steaks are on the grill All the boys are headed down to the Yellow Hotel See you. 